Good afternoon, and welcome to our first program of the spring quarter. Our program today includes three prominent members of the NBC News Service, um, Jess Marlowe, Tom Brokaw, and Ross Porter. Uh, I hope Mr. Brokaw and Marlowe will make an opening statement. If not, we're going to go straight into a question and answer period. Are you going to make an opening statement? If you'd like to. Please. <laughs> I've been looking at some things recently that indicate to me that maybe we ought to be out talking to our audience once in a while on a on a face-to-face -face basis. Uh, I'm not sure this is a representative audience, <laughs> considering the kind of audience that we're told we speak, at least I speak to, at 5 o'clock each evening. Uh, the people who talk about demographics tell me that I speak largely to a, a mostly female, mostly middle-aged audience. Uh, so I, uh, I gather from what I can see you are hardly representative of that. We've been a little curious, a little concerned about uh, what our audience uh, thinks about us, but even more concerned about what our audience might want to do about us. We noticed, uh, <laughs> not to us, about us. I noticed TV Guide had a, a recent survey that indicated that about 45% of the people in the country who watch television news think we're biased. But I was relieved to see that uh, almost half think we're biased on the left, the other half think we're biased on the right. <laughs> so I guess we're doing pretty well by playing it right down the middle, but it's a little discouraging to think that 45% of the people think that, that you're a little biased. But my real concern is uh, another survey taken uh, by the Gallup people not too long ago that indicated that 51% of the people in this country are sufficiently concerned about what television news has shown them about their world prompted, I suspect, by the man who holds the second highest office in the land and some of his concern about uh, what television news is doing, are now willing to see some sort of small restraint on a free press. Uh, we can kid about Vice President Agnew, and I'm perfectly willing to, <laughs> but, uh, but we really can't kid very much about the fact that 51% of the people polled are willing to see some little restraint of the press because they don't like what the press has been telling them about their world. So I think we need an opportunity to get out like this and to meet our audience and to talk to them and tell them what some of the risks are when they begin to talk about a restraint of the press. Now, if you could restrain the press in your direction to get the press to say what you want them to say, then you might consider that. But a restraint of the press doesn't work that way. Anytime you've got a, a restrained press, you also have limited your ability where, when it comes to free speech, when it comes to a free society, and I'm not talking about the flag-waving type of free society. I'm talking about a genuinely free society. If you don't have a, a free press, you don't have a free society. So I just leave you with the notion that uh, it's a great risk, this thought that you can restrict the press just a little bit. It's the classic case of being a little bit pregnant. Thank you. <laughs> well, let me only say that I uh, endorse everything that my colleague, Mr. Marlowe, has said to you today. And let me also add, however, that I like to think that you are more representative of the kind of audience that I have at 11 o'clock than perhaps you are of the kind of audience that he has at 5 o'clock. <laughs> it, uh, it is, again, uh, the people who worry about the demographics who tell us that. I guess middle-aged females aren't able to stay up that late. I like to think that all of you can. Let me give you something to, to pick on, if you will, here today and that is the definition of news. It would be a lot easier for us if there were a scientific formula of some kind, a hard application that we could make to a given situation and say, it comes out news. Well, there isn't that kind of formula. And so, in a very general way, we think of news as interesting and significant change as reported by an outsider, that is, as reported by a journalist. Now, that gives us a very wide range, as you can appreciate. And then there are stories that appear in our programs and segments of our programs that don't fit that at all, that, that our segments are stories that just happen to be interesting or funny or fascinating in one fashion or another, and so they make the program as well. Let me also tell you that we think of ourselves as some kind of forum for truth that is, a place that society can turn to get the information that it needs to make its day-to-day -day decisions about what is going on. 
And in that context, I will say to you right off the bat that we have made mistakes in the past, and I suspect that we will continue to make them in the future. I think that we have covered people and events out of proportion to their significance. I think that we have made errors of omission as well. That is, we have failed to report on people or events that later turned about, turn out to be more significant than our original judgment indicated. So we are not infallible, although we try to give you that impression from time to time. And with that, I would just like to say that we appreciate uh, the most robust kind of debate in these sessions. We like them to be as vigorous as possible because this is your opportunity to talk back to us in person and not just yell at us in that kind of one-way electronic situation that most of you have in your homes with a television set. This time you get to hear us talk back, and we'd like to hear from you. Now, I did not borrow that phrase from George Putnam and his new... <laughs> and his new 1030 sh charade that he has going every night. <laughs> I can promise you that contrary to what Mr. Putnam is doing, we will try to be responsive to your questions. Uh, we have two roving mics. Uh, again, please, use the mic so that everyone can hear your question. And uh, we are taping it, so it would be beneficial to everyone if you use the roving mics. We have two on each side, so if you raise your hand, the mic will be brought to you. This is a question right here. No, wait, wait for the mic, please. Why didn't Tom Snyder come? He had an early tee off time at Balboa this morning. What, what always uh, bothers me in this age of uh, public officials rarely having news conferences is that um, I, as a citizen, almost never get a chance to hear what they have to say. And I write a letter to my congressman or somebody, and they never answer me. Now, what I want to know is, on a program like News Conference, why can't you have one outside interested citizen come in and ask the kind of questions that I think uh, an interested citizen would like to ask? Now, Robert Abernathy and people like that, the po the, I mean, the point is, if you, if you really go too tough on a lot of these people, they're not going to want to come back on News Conference. Now, I noticed once Tom Snyder did an interview of, uh, must have been State Assemblyman or State Senator John Harmer, and he just ripped the man to shreds. He was asking, he was asking, he was asking Harmer questions like, Harmer was there uh, talking about clamp down on pornography, and Snyder says, well, if we allow people the freedom to vote for president, how come we can't allow them the freedom to read what they want to read? I mean, they're mature adults. Those are the kind of questions I want to hear asked on television. And if you guys aren't going to ask it, why can't you let somebody else come up there and ask it? Well, let me tell you that as a result of one of the questions that I asked on news conference one time, I'm being sued for $2 million <laughs> by two Los Angeles policemen. Now, I don't know how much tougher you want us to be. Uh, <laughs> we can make it $4 million the next time if that would ha satisfy you. Let me also tell you that the kinds of questions that we ask in that program are based as much as possible on factual material and not subjective kinds of biases of one kind or another. We're seeking information on that program. We are not attempting in one way or another to engage them in a philosophical debate. We have a little disclaimer there that we say that please remember that our questions do not necessarily reflect personal opinion because we are there as journalists. We're there in an attempt to get truthful information out of the man. Now, we recognize that on many occasions that they're not being entirely truthful with us, and we attempt on those occasions to pin them down with factual material. Uh, we recognize sometimes that they bypass that, circumvent our questions in whatever fashion possible. We have to move on to new material, new subject matter, because we, we know that we only have 30 minutes in which to get as much as we can out of that particular guest. Let me also say to you that almost all of the guests that we've had on that program news conference have said to us, and I don't think that they're doing that just to pat us on the back, that we are better prepared than any other program in town. 
the program to which you referred to with Tom Snyder interrogating Senator John Harmer was a different kind of program. That is a personal vehicle, if you will, for Tom Snyder. Uh, the Sunday program, I think, is the one in which he appeared. He is acting in a different capacity there than he is as a journalist. He's, he has greater freedom to be Tom Snyder than we do as journalists on the program News Conference. Now, the same kind, if you monitor that program, however, on the other hand, News Conference carefully, I think that you'll find that we are pretty vigorous in most of our questioning. This case of finding an interested outside uh, citizen uh, intrigues me. How in the world would we possibly select that one outsider? You know, what would happen if we picked one and he happened to be uh, completely partial to the views of our guests? Then what would you say, you see? We have to have controls over that program, and we think that as journalists we reflect in one sense factual material and community interest as well. We do a pretty thorough job of trying to find out what is going on before they arrive. The only thing I would like to add to that is that the notion that if we ask the tough question, the guest would not come back, we would respond to that if the guest were to suggest that, then you are welcome not ever to come back, and they are perfectly aware of that. Uh, but we find that particularly most political leaders of the kind I assume you'd like to ask these questions of uh, are more than anxious to come. They like the forum. They like the audience. But I can, I can also tell you that they frequently like the tough question, too. There are occasionally instances where we have asked questions that were, were difficult for us to even phrase. I can recall when John Tunney was a guest on that particular program one time when we had gotten into a discussion. Um, We'd gotten into a discussion about Ted Kennedy's future as a result of Chappaquiddick. And then we finally, it had to be asked, if you recall, his sister was charged with murder in England. And it's a pretty difficult question to, to ask a man about that. So we tried it as carefully as we could, or I did, to, to phrase it with some compassion to say, look, I don't want to increase your, your discomfort. I don't want to increase your suffering. But you have a problem in your own family where your sister is concerned. Have you anything you'd like to say about that? And later, John Tunney said he welcomed the question because it was one that no one had asked and it was one that desperately needed to be answered. Uh, and so frequently, the politician is anxious to have a chance to answer the most girlish charge imaginable, particularly if it had any, uh, if it had had any publicity. So he wants to answer that. No question about it. But if he chooses not to come back because the questions were too tough, uh, we certainly don't care. Yes. Uh, in, in regards to Mr. Marlowe's comments on uh, Agnew's uh, restrictions that he would like to see, or uh, w w what I would uh, want to ask is how much uh, political maneuvering is there in some of the, the changeovers that occur within the uh, with, as to who is going to be the newscaster now? Of course, there, there hasn't been uh, any changeover uh, recently on Channel 2. Most of it has been on 7 and, and only some on 4 on your station. But how much is, uh, of it is caused by the... Uh, <clears throat> by the political maneuvering from above? I would say that uh, none of it is caused by political maneuvering of, from above. It is caused uh, principally by a failure to get some kind of response in the rating books. That's what causes changes in newscasting most of the time, the kind of people that you see on the air. That it has nothing to do with Mr. Agnew or Mr. Nixon, but it has something to do with Mr. Nielsen and the American Research Bureau. Uh, on that subject, how much... I mean, I think you have a kind of a conflicting role. You're journalists and, and you're also TV personalities. How much does the rating game uh, detract from, from actually getting the news across? Why don't you talk to them? Well, I think, unlike my colleagues here, I'm in a little different situation. I think that in sports, uh, I have the opportunity to uh, give my own opinions much more than Tom or Jess or any news anchorman. Uh, may I say that in the five years I've been at KNBC, I've never had anyone come to me and say, say this or don't say this. Uh, I don't think either one of these two gentlemen can go on and give their opinion tonight on what they think about the Vietnam War. But if I want to go on and, think, and say what I think about the baseball strike, that's perfectly acceptable. After all, they hired me to give my opinions. My wife's got a prettier face than I do. She could go down there and rip the wire service copy every day and, and uh, probably type just about as well as I could. So uh, I don't think 
and, and back to your question, I don't think that the ratings have anything to do with the way we write our, our script at all. I think, uh, I think if anything else, it's the time problem. We've got only so much time to say a certain amount of things, and uh, so we have to write with brevity. Ross, I would disagree to some extent because I do think the ratings, or the lack of them, have influenced personalities on programs and have influenced programs. Hopefully they have not influenced the serious content of the program. And I refer to the happy news format, which is a, a, a direct answer to poor ratings. And it's the reason we're seeing the happy news format developing. It's the reason you're seeing a guy who is cute on television. <laughs> it's the reason you're seeing a guy who is, a, who is basically an entertainer, occasionally doing news on television. It's why you see ad agencies running these absurd ads in, in San Francisco. Our affiliate, KRON, currently has an ad running with all their anchormen with, with dogs' masks on and, and a cute line at the bottom of it, which means absolutely nothing. It's rather degrading, but that is a, a direct response to it. Now, if, if the guys who are doing happy news and the guys who are being cute, if they are, as they say, taking the news seriously but not taking themselves seriously, that's fine. I don't think we need to be embarrassed at all over trying to attract an audience because if you've got a message, if you're trying to inform people and you don't have an audience, you're kidding yourself. So you desperately need that audience. I do think we're beginning to go a little too far in the other direction. I think we're getting a bit too cute. And I think there are some areas where this has, grown, uh, has worn rather thin and they're beginning to come back to doing a fairly serious job of reporting news. But as long as they confine it to doing the news seriously but uh, not taking themselves seriously, that's fine. I go along with it. But I think that's an example of a response to the rating that you refer to. I'd like to know who determines um, the order of the stories that are put up each night and who determines which uh, stories are going to be broadcast and also is there any competition from the national news or censorship, uh, not censorship, excuse me, is there any competition that you are, or no, news stories that you don't do because they'll be covered on the, the national news that night? And do you find this a problem, if so? The, the stories are determined kind of by group think at KNBC. I mean, it is very much in concert. Uh, there are a number of people involved in the process of determining what stories we're going to cover that day and in what order they will appear on the air. Assignment editors, producers of programs, anchormen even get a word in once in a while. Uh, there are executive producers as well. And there is no one individual who dictates the nature of the program. But let me also say to you that it is generally very obvious what the news of the day is in terms of the time in which we have to report it. In an hour-long program, there is, what, 32, not 28 minutes now? 28 minutes of actual news time uh, when you deduct commercials and, I think, sports and weather. Uh, <laughs> When, at, at 11 o'clock at night, when you deduct sports and weather, there is uh, less than 16 minutes of news time. So if I were to take any of you there and say, here is the budget for the day, here is what's going on in the city, in, La in California, and in the world, what stories do you think that we ought to pay attention to and in which order, you would probably arrive at pretty much the same conclusion that we do most nights. You wouldn't be able to understand, we like to think, uh, the... Uh, produc production techniques that are necessary to put them on in a more coherent fashion. So there is no one person. Uh, the news of the day generally on television is pretty obvious. We like to do some enterprise of our own, that is, go out and find a story uh, or generate some kind of a story on our own that gives us a uniqueness from the other programs. We also like to think that in covering the news of the day, we do a little better job of it than two and seven, our principal competitors, do. Uh, there was another part of your question about censorship. Oh, yes, we are aware of what the national programs are putting on the air. Uh, although just now, because of the vastly changing audience in Los Angeles, at 5 o'clock can take something out of the incoming nightly news, which we see here at 3.30 in the afternoon at KNBC, because it's being done in New York, of course. But you see it at 7. Yeah. You see it at 7, we see it at 3.30. We'll take something out of that and it'll run in Jess Marlowe's 5 o'clock program because that audience probably isn't going to be around at 7 o'clock. And the audience that's coming in at 7 probably has not seen the 5 o'clock audience, or the 5 o'clock show. So we are, in some fashion, uh, dictated by what happens 
on the nightly news, although very, very little. At 11 o'clock at night, we're able to steal from all the programs, you see, so that's very helpful. But the, that doesn't mean because, uh, well, for instance, Snyder at six, because he butts right up against nightly news, frequently isn't able to, to steal a piece of film out of theirs because it's going to follow right after him. But that doesn't mean he's not going to do the story. If it's an important, significant story, he'll still have the story. But he may not be able to use the particular report, the same report that Nightly News is going to have, our, our correspondence. And for instance, now we're, we're stealing an awful lot of stuff off Nightly News that's coming out of, uh, of Vietnam. Um, so he'll still have the story, but he may not have the specific report that would be in. Yeah, my question deals with a uh, story that you carried last night concerning the interview of, I think it was a major general, and the heightened fighting going on in Vietnam. And his comment was, what, I think the question was, what's going to happen when you chase them back into uh, Laos or Cambodia? Right. And he says, we're going to kill them all. That was his quote. And, I just, and then there was a chuckle in the background. I think you picked it up, uh, Mr. Brokaw, because you sort of hesitated for a second. I was just wondering if there's uh, any kind of initial reaction from the public concerning a quote like that and how you deal with something like that. You're the first, uh, you're the first one to react to what I expected would be some kind of a response to that, unfortunately. Uh, in that case, we have stage crews. I mean, that is people who are working behind the scenes there. And uh, uh, that, was a very, that was a very tough situation. We had a little chat during the commercial, uh, the stage crew and, and I did, about, uh, about them listening to the time cues as well. I don't think that their, that their laughter was an endorsement of what the Major General was having to say but what they perceive to be the ludicrous nature of his yeah, remarks. Um, I think it's unfortunate that that laughter got out on the air because it could be misconstrued. And uh, that happens from time to time. I mean, it is a program. It is one of the, all the programs that we do are live, painfully so some nights. And that is an example of the risks that you take in a live program. I did hesitate for a moment. Uh, that's a risk we all take. It isn't just the stagehands who are guilty of that. I did the same thing yesterday when we had that same tape at five, and, and we're human beings. We respond, too. And when we're behind tape, ordinarily our mics are closed. And I remember saying to uh, the associate director who was on the floor, that guy must have seen Patton 17 times. <laughs> And, you know, my mic could have been opened by mistake, and that really, it, it was a foolish thing for me to have done, too. We, we frequently do that, and uh, less frequently as we get caught. Well, what I wanted to some also... Of them, some of them we cannot repeat here, as a matter of fact. <laughs> what I wanted to also know, was there any kind of public reaction, you know, immediately to the, the quote by the Major General? None or, that I got. I no. think it was fairly obvious, though. I, really. Yeah. I don't know. We didn't get any. Uh, we didn't get any phone calls on it. But that's the kind of thing that we don't get phone calls yeah. on. Uh, was, I think it was pretty clear. Uh, the man's posturing was uh, was not subtle. <laughs> uh, personalities are are important in gathering an audience, and uh, and the credibility of newsmen is depends on the personality and how people see them. And I was wondering, there's an article in Time and in Newsweek about uh, Chet Huntley going in the advertising thing. I was wondering on how you feel about that and what do you think it's going to do to your credibility? This is in one case in which we censor our own comments in a way. We, uh, we feel very strongly that he is doing his profession a great disservice. I feel very strongly that he is. Uh, I'm terribly disappointed that he's found it necessary to attempt to pass himself off as a news commentator in his endorsement of American Airlines and a couple of other things that he has done. I wish that uh, we all know that he made a lot of money at NBC and that he retired to what he said was going to be a very bountiful situation in Montana. And I wish that he would leave it at that and that uh, this masquerade of being a newscaster and doing a reporting job on American Airlines uh, seems to me to be scandalous. I feel very strongly about it. But I felt strongly about a couple of things that Mr. Huntley has done in the past. I would have to say, too, that NBC has to accept part of the responsibility, not only NBC, but all the, the uh, networks, because the first week that those commercials were on the air, they were placed specifically in newscasts, which further gives you the notion that he is a newscaster doing this commercial. And, uh, and frankly, uh, NBC should have said thanks, but no thanks. They could have taken the commercials elsewhere, but not in a newscast. Uh, and they did not do that either. Well, Ross has a few examples of uh, guys in sports doing commercials, too, though. I'd like to direct this question to uh, either um, Mr. Brokaw or Mr. Marlowe. Uh, 
it seems as if the uh, editorials, and particularly uh, Bob Abernathy's comment on the 6 o'clock news, seem to uh, generate a lot less controversy and have a lot less teeth in them than editorials in the printed media. I, for example, the New York Times, Washington Post, or uh, our own Los Angeles Times. Is this to uh, avoid controversy with the sponsors that you may, for example, if Abernathy came out with a strong editorial against, uh, say, uh, cigarettes, for example, uh, this would have been more applicable a couple of years ago. For example, uh, the safety of automobiles. NBC may stand to lose uh, a very lucrative sponsor. Is this the primary reason why editorials, uh, it's, I think it's generally acknowledged, editorials on television have a lot less teeth in them than editorials in the printed media. Yeah. That is not an editorial that Bob Abernathy does. That's commentary. That's uh, news analysis. It's Bob Abernathy's viewpoint. Call it what you will. The editorial comes at the end of the program, separated by commercials and uh, credits, I think, even. Right? Debbie Rice. Yeah, <laughs> separated by Debbie Rice. <laughs> Someone called in the other night and said, you want to hear an oddity in the news? And I said, yes. And they said, Debbie Rice. And I don't know. What that <laughs> That's unfair to her. We're not here to pick on Debbie Rice because uh, she's put in an uncomfortable situation by other people at NBC, and we're not blaming her. Which is why she looks that way. Yeah. <laughs> Bob Abernathy's uh, point of view that we were talking about... Uh, uh, Bob Abernathy's point of view is precisely that. The editorial is a function of an editorial board representing management at KNBC. I think that a couple of our news executives participate in the process of determining subjects and the approach that they'll take. They really have very little to do with it. The rest of us don't even know what is going to be going into the KNBC editorials or what the subject matter will be. Abernathy's point of view, I beg to differ with you, are quite strong. If you watched last night, for instance, he was expressing outrage at the lack of response in this community to the proposed budget cuts within the city school system, saying that it is time for uh, an education lobby, if you will, to go to Sacramento. He has in the past been very strong on campaign finance, I know. He's been very strong, for instance, on John Lindsay uh, coming out of the Republican Party and immediately into the Democratic presidential race on a number of subjects that I can recall that he has been as strong, if not stronger, than editorials in the New York Times and in the Los Angeles Times. But he is not an editorialist there. He is a commentator. He is more akin to a columnist. He's more a craft or a DJR Bruckner than he is an editorial writer when he's acting in that capacity. And as a matter of fact, we do get a fairly strong response to a lot of things that he said. Recently, I think the... Uh, uh, you all know probably that we're having an anniversary, as it were, of the, of the um, uh, internment of the Japanese Americans during World War II, and Bob did a viewpoint on that. And believe me, the NBC switchboard immediately became Christmas tree. Uh, it just lit up all over the place. And that happens on many occasions. I think, too, you, you have to... I, I thought we had dispelled the notion when, uh, when television covered all the stories about the Surgeon General's report about the linking between cigarette smoking and health, dispelled the notion that, that we as newscasters are influenced by our sponsors. Uh, let me assure you that from the days when they had an individual sponsor for a single newscast, those days are gone, except I think on some of the weekend newscasts you'll have Humble Oil sponsoring a whole newscast, but generally sponsors just buy a spot within a newscast, particularly the hour programs, and we don't even know who the sponsors are. Uh, I can lead into a commercial and I haven't the foggiest idea uh, who the commercial sponsor is. They simply do not influence us. And I think we've done enough stories about the link between cigarette smoking and health. I'm sure uh, Pan Am and TWA would like us to quit talking about skyjackings, too. Uh, there have been, uh, and we've done the Ralph Nader stories. And, and frankly, um, in my 13 years in broadcasting, I've never had an occasion where a sponsor succeeded in influencing the news. Uh, at small stations where you're more intimately involved with the sponsors, I've seen them try. But no responsible broadcaster is, is going to knuckle to that kind of thing, and it just doesn't happen. Uh, we, we get caught occasionally. We had Chuck Walsh doing a review the other day, a movie review, and he did it on... Uh, Carrie's Treatment. Yeah, Carrie's Treatment, and, and we went to a commercial right after him, and there were three commercials, three short ones, and the middle commercial was a commercial for Carrie's Treatment. And we were damned embarrassed because he gave it a good review, and it began to, you know, you'd say, look, the audience at home is going to, he's destroying his credibility. So this is one occasion where we're going to look to see what the commercial is to try to avoid that in the future because uh, 
Uh, I wish she had panned Carrie's treatment. <laughs> then it wouldn't have been so bad. But it was really awkward because he praised it, and then you had the lousy uh, commercial. Wait, let me. No, no, no. Let me tell you that. It, that uh, the only time that I can remember any kind of commercial interference is that, uh, or the only time, and it's a continuing basis. If we have an air tragedy of some kind in which 80 people are killed and a major airline crash, we are asked not to put that story next to the fly the friendly skies of United commercial. <laughs> we think that's only fair. That uh, it, it's a little bit harsh to come out of a story of, uh, of an airline going down somewhere and killing 80 people and cut from that immediately to fly Pan Am or one of the other airline commercials. That's the only time. In that case, what we do is drop the commercial out of the program. We don't drop the story, and NBC forfeits the revenue from that commercial uh, on that occasion. Now, we don't mind that, the news department. I'm sure that it causes some teeth gnashing in the sales department, however. Yes, um, sports seems to occupy a smaller, uh, a smaller proportion of space in places like Time Magazine or the Los Angeles Times. Um, how do you decide how much time is to be allotted to sports on any particular evening? That time is uh, budgeted for me by the respective producers of the shows. Um, more than the news, I would say... Uh, I'm pretty much my own producer because I write. I'm not going to challenge I, that. <laughs> because I write my script, I cut my film, I do all the writing. Um, so, but that is budgeted for me per night. I know what I have going in. If it's a heavy night, I go to the producer and say, "Hey, I need a little bit more." They may come to me and say, "We've had a very heavy news day, and if it's pretty light in sports, could you cut down 30 seconds or so?" So that's that's pretty much set going in. It's almost never that amicable, however. <laughs> Every sports I haven't had any problems, though. So. I, ha I have one more question. It's I can't resist one, one comment on what Ross said. He says he is his own producer. Those of you who don't know, Ross has two sets of twins in his family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it seems to be becoming more. It seems to be becoming more and more of a joke about. Uh, the way moonshots are being covered these days. You know, uh, this is one guy cutting back to another guy and one guy cutting back to another. They're all just trying to fill the time. Um, I've heard so many jokes about it. What's, uh, what's, what are newscasters going to do about this? Uh, they, do you foresee any changes in the future in the coverage of these shots? Cancel the moon. I don't know what we'll do about it. The part of the problem is that it is a, an enormous time-consuming process, as you know, that they are in space for a good deal of time and that they are in critical situations very often during the flight, and we have to be there covering it. I have not picked up on what you see, the uh, humorous approach to it. I think that it is still taken uh, very seriously by all of the people who are involved. Uh, that is. The news commentators for NBC, I know, uh, take it quite seriously. It's a very expensive proposition to cover a moonshot. Uh, but in killing time, they occasionally engage in some levity. Yeah. Yeah. And they try to make it more interesting and more human, of course. I think that it's, uh, I think it's symptomatic, the moonshot especially, of how dulled we've all become by the tremendous amount of change taking place in our lives. Now, this generation, most of the people in this audience, uh, is taking for granted a landing on the moon and the fact that uh, there have been uh, a couple now and most people can't remember the date or the people who were the first men on the moon. You must remember that within your parents' generation or within the generation of your elders, Lindbergh's flight is still an event that is indelibly imprinted on their mind just going across the Atlantic. So I think that you see something here of the kind of change that has been popularized in books like Future Shock and so on that we're trying to deal with. And that's part of the problem of television news, is that the change is so rapid and so many times it happens uh, uh, faster than we're able to comprehend it that it's easier to just dismiss it or set it aside. I think a moonshot is symptomatic of that kind of thing. We've got one coming this weekend, and I think you'll see less continuous coverage on this one than you did in the previous one. It's just beginning to diminish, and there will be, uh, hopefully, not these long periods of inactivity when there really isn't a heck of a lot to report. And it does get tedious and dull, I agree. 
This is directed to Mr. Porter and Mr. Brokaw. You mentioned earlier that the amount of time for news on the 11 o'clock news is 16 minutes, and I would guess sports to be th between 3 and 5. How thorough a job can television news do in such a short time compared to other media? Why don't you tell what you can do with sports? You're the anchor man. You answer that. <laughs> Well, we can't do a very thorough job, and one of the uh, penalties of doing a half an hour program at 11 o'clock is that you can't do as thorough a job as you can, say, at, uh, at 6 o'clock in the hour program, although I like to think that we are not, that we're not doing just half the job because we have only half the time. In a sense, we have uh, the full day to reflect on and so on. Television news, and I have to be very careful so this doesn't have a completely negative connotation here, but television news principally is kind of an electronic diary on what has happened that day in the world. Uh, we have called it in the past a headline service, but that has a very negative connotation. We're more than a headline service, really. But if you were to take the hour program at 6 o'clock or at 5 o'clock and transcribe it into print, it would fill up the front page of the Los Angeles Times, a little bit of the sports section and a little bit of the business and feature sections, and that's all. So it is, we cannot give in-depth treatment. We recognize that most people get most of their news from television, and I, for one, find that frightening. I always urge my audiences to have a wide range of information gathering going on. I personally, and all of us do, read a lot of newspapers and periodicals and books and so on, and that's the only way that you can be fully informed. We can only give you kind of a taste of what has happened that day, and we like to think, whet your appetite for more information, and so that's the dilemma that we have. On the other hand, we have immediacy, which we think is important, that you know about it very quickly after it has happened, an event, sometimes while it is going on. And that's important in the decision-making process as well. I wholeheartedly agree with that. I, I feel that, uh, especially at 11 o'clock, at 6 o'clock you've got more time to go into features. At 11 o'clock on sports, you have primarily light scores from the night that you want to get across. And I think also you've got to remember that we're in a medium where the visual part of it is highly important. And if we can show uh, action of a, a sports event that occurred that night, it's far, it's far greater, even though it's short, to get that in and let people see it uh, than to just do a radio show every night. And uh, I agree with Tom. I don't, I don't think at 11 o'clock that we can consider ourselves in any kind of competition with the newspapers. But I would far prefer that someone hear 12 or 14 sports stories and know when they go to bed what's happened in sports and then get up the next morning and read about it more in depth in the newspapers than if we gave them six or seven stories and uh, said good night. This question is in regards to sky hijacking. Do you feel that the news inadvertently encourages sky, or I should say people to hijack airplanes by giving uh, hijacking as much coverage as it has been given in the past? For example, when the ex-Marine hijacked a plane to Italy. Became a folk hero, mm -hmm. that's yes. what you're saying. Uh, that's a continuing dilemma for us, and I engage in uh, really vigorous arguments with friends of mine that I always think have a greater appreciation of the dilemmas of our business than they sometimes have. It went on just last weekend. A friend of mine said that there probably ought to be a moratorium on reporting skyjacking in mass media. And I said, quite the contrary. Uh, I think in your program yesterday, or I think it was yesterday, or perhaps the day before, they made a clear point of pointing out uh, the abortive hijacking attempt of the PSA plane in San Diego, that it was the eighth attempt in the last few months in the West Coast, and, all, and seven of the eight people have been caught. It's more important, it seems to me, the people who are about to fly airplanes know of the risks that are involved. Now, I know that there have been, the police even have a, a, a phrase for this, which I can't recall, but it's a carbon copy kind of crime in which the guy just imitates what, he, what he's read or is, what he's heard about another kind of crime. But we think it's more important that society knows that it's been going on than not know when it is going on. There are, there are occasions when we cooperate with the authorities and not reporting an event that may attract more people. But in this case, uh, the dilemma is, are we encouraging it? And I think that that kind of thing, that kind of phenomenon now is so out of hand that people are going to hijack whether we talk about it or not. Uh, it's a constant dilemma. 
I, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, it's something that we all think about, but we think that uh, society is better served by more information than by less. That's I was more concerned about it last week than I am this week uh, when we had D.B. Cooper, who was obviously or apparently still at large. But now that we've reported uh, some of the captures, I think it is less a problem. But, you know, we felt the same way in the earlier days of television about, I can remember in small communities, we worried about reporting suicides and, in fact, at one time quit reporting suicides because there seemed to be copycat suicides. Behavioral scientists did some research on it and said, no, you're wrong. The technique may be copied, but the suicide would have occurred anyway. And I suspect that you might be able to conclude that, that the people who, uh, who hijack an airliner for ransom might have held up a bank if they had not hijacked the airline. I'm not sure. I think the crime may have occurred, a crime may have occurred, uh, given the, the instance of the, the guy in, in uh, Provo, Utah, who apparently had severe financial stress. But the not only that, but let me, let me just add one more thing. We don't make folk heroes out of those people. You know, society makes folk heroes out of those people. Your response to D.B. Cooper is what made him a folk hero, not just our exposure of his exploits. Uh, when we went out to find out what people thought of what D.B. Cooper had done, most people did not say to us, he's a malicious criminal. Most people said, I think it's great, man. He beat the system for $200,000 and apparently got away, you see. So we're reflecting, in that sense, public opinion about D.B. Cooper. And the same thing, I suspect that there was a lot of feeling about this guy who pulled the job in San Francisco and bailed out over Utah. People are fascinated by that kind of thing, this elaborate procedure and uh, careful organization. Well, eventually he got caught. Now, we reported the facts, and people responded in their own way. Okay? To go a step further, though, don't you recall, though, that the years you're talking about the past history where people would call and say, hey, We'll start a riot for you at 1.30 if you'll yeah. be out there. You know. Yeah. We got caught in some of those traps. There's no question about that. In the early days, I mean, I had a tremendous feeling of deja vu walking across the campus today because Tom Hayden is speaking uh, down below here on the new developments in Vietnam and what can be done about it. Well, uh, I can remember when Tom Hayden was speaking about the new developments in Vietnam and what can be done about it uh, when I first came to California. Uh, six years ago, not Tom Hayden at that time, Mario Savio in, uh, in Berkeley. And I had this tremendous feeling of deja vu. You are the, the generation, if you will, of the demonstration, but it's a relatively new technique. And I can recall when demonstration, uh, picketing, marching, gathering somewhere first became popular, and it was a kind of natural television story. It was picture and action and sound and so on, and we all rushed out to cover everything that was happening. Well the people who were organizing very quickly caught on how they could use us and did on a couple of occasions. And uh, we still get calls from people saying, tomorrow we're going to be at 1.30 picketing so-and-so, show up. Or if you're there, we'll have something going. Or the cameras are here and a lot of people show up. We've learned now to canvas those situations more carefully and to survey uh, an advertised demonstration or picket line of one kind or another before we roll film. So we did get caught in the past, and that's what I said at the outset, but I think that we're much better about that now. In fact, we overreact. I think that we sometimes don't cover legitimate demonstrations because it has that word in it. We have time for two more questions. Take one from here. I'd like to direct the question to uh, Mr. Porter. Uh, the coverage at Sapporo was fine, but uh, it didn't quite have the spontaneity that a live demonstration would have. Will the Munich coverage be live? The Munich coverage will be by ABC. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think that uh, the Winter Olympic Games, and believe me, having seen every second of them, <laughs> uh, I speak from experience, did uh, leave something to be desired. I think, though, you have to consider, too, that the Japanese ran the cameras and the NHK uh, had all the placements as to what they could have, and, and there was no way for NBC to go out on the venues and do their own coverage as they might, let's say, a political convention. But uh, I think they learned a lot. Uh, I am hoping that at least uh, one of you have some familiarity with this instance. I'm a representative of a... Uh, organization of former psychiatric patients called NOVA. And around January, I believe, 
Uh, I think it was Tom Brokaw interviewed one of our members for several hours, and then a day or two later, a film crew came out to film one of our meetings in Santa Monica. We were told that uh, probably there would be a presentation late in February, and now here it is April, and there's still no word. I'm wondering why the uh, why no coverage on our uh, issues? What we elected to do in that case was to incorporate you into a larger story on the new program of treating mental illness in California. We decided that within NOVA uh, that there wasn't a, a story sufficiently large enough for what we wanted to do in terms of uh, the, the mental illness thing. And I can't tell you when that story will be on the air, but it will be incorporated into a much larger treatment of the treat, uh, of mental illness. Uh, I'd like to say that I feel, had we been representative, say, of a black power group or a Chicano group or something similar, that there would have been relatively instantaneous coverage. Yeah. And whereas we are in a position where I think we're discriminated against far more than either of these groups, both at large and by the media as well. Well, I, I, I recognize the, the, the dilemma that you have, and, and uh, I found myself very personally sympathetic to that situation, but let me also tell you that I am constantly um, told by members of Chicano and black organizations that they feel that if they were representative of some white establishment group that they would get on the air instantaneously. So it's the kind of <coughs> continuing cycle that we have. This is a very large community. Any community is large in terms of the interest at work in it and trying to be representative and reflective of all those interests is a difficult job for us and we do the best that we can. We are aware of your situation. As I say, we're going to include it hopefully uh, in a larger treatment of uh, mental illness in California. But I think it's unfair for you to say that we discriminated against you because you happen to be a former psychiatric patient, because those accusations have come to us from people who are former addicts, and policemen make those accusations against us constantly. Blacks and Chicanos make those accusations. The Republican establishment makes that accusation. So you're in a rather good company. Well, yes. rather than claiming discrimination as a result of our status, though, I think if we did represent a more popular cause, we would have uh, more coverage. Uh, I I'd think like that's to say true. Sure. I think if, I think if, 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 it, if you represented a much larger problem, you probably would have coverage. But, but that I, is not to say that you're not going to get coverage because you have a problem. However, I don't think the enormity of our problem is realized either. For instance, there are 1,200 board and care homes in Los Angeles County, halfway houses, having probably a, a resident population of 15,000 or more. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think that it, the enormity of the problem really is realized. There's a lot of talk about mental health, but very little talk about the mental health consumer. Yeah, I, we, we're aware of that, and I can only tell you that we're attempting to, to do something about it in a larger sense. I have one last question for Mr. Porter. Uh, why is it that NBC can't hire somebody who can do the game of the week or sports <laughs> announcing besides whoever does it? I don't want to mention his name, but he's terrible. His name is Kurt Gowdy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Those decisions are all made in New York. That's all I can say. Thank you very much. Okay.